So good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming to my talk today. My name is Niu Jun. I'm a PhD student uh, at Technical University Darmstadt uh, in Darmstadt, Germany. Uh, what I'd like to present to you today is a numerically consistent and structured real F discretization for the um, two phase momentum convection uh, with high density ratio. In this slide, I will uh, outline contents of this small talk. Uh, a brief introduction to the modeling, modeling for two-phase flow is given at first as I will introduce how the numerical consistency, uh, consistency we reviewed comes. After that, uh, I will show our implementation of the consistency on two interface tracking methods. Then uh, the conclusion and outlook uh, as well as the uh, acknowledgement. Okay, mm, let's start with the modeling backgrounds. Um, two phase flows are uh, uh, ubiquitous in industrial and scientific applications. And therefore, uh, they are the focus of mining computational studies. A simple uh, example sketch is shown uh, in the left fig. The phase uh, indicator chi is uh, used to distinguish the two phases and the interface uh, sigma separates the two phases. There are many uh, different numerical methods for involving chi, uh, uh, like um, uh, namely tracking the interface, uh, like uh, uh, volume of fluid level side and form tracking. Each method has further multiple variants, uh, such as split uh, VOF, unsplit VOF, flux, or cell based VOF. Uh, there is no recognized best choice, uh, but people hold their own best one. The single field uh, formulation of Navier-Stokes equations is normally used to model the uh, incompressible two-phase flow. The phase indicator chi uh, indicates two uh, phases by two values. So the chi density and uh, viscosity uh, have this uniform uh, form. Mm, since the phase phases are incompressible. We have the divergence-free uh, velocity field. And then we have the single field formulation of momentum conservation uh, equation. The discontinuity of densities and only interface affected uh, surface tension cause critical issues uh, when numerically solving the momentum uh, equation. Let's focus on a very um, simple case to bring in the problem we catch. Uh, here is a, a invasive droplet translates with the ambient flow. They are given a constant initial velocity. Uh, we limit the forces terms uh, on right hand side of the uh, momentum equation. Then we have uh, such pure momentum advection uh, equation. Discretize this equation using collocated uh, finite uh, volume method and using explicit Euler temporal scheme. Then we have uh, equation seven. Considering the given uh, condition, no force ex is uh, exerted uh, on the droplet. So we can say the uh, velocity keeps constant, uh, both spatially and uh, temporally uh, during the translation. More specifically, uh, it means the cell phase uh, center velocity uh, marked by F is equal to the uh, cell center uh, velocity uh, marked by C and the uh, velocity at any time step should be equal. So uh, after uh, dropping out the equal velocity terms on both sides of equation eight, so we have uh, the equation nine, it's the discrete uh, mass conservation equation. These two equations indicate a uh, consistency between mass and momentum conservation equation, which is called uh, mass flux consistency. In our previous work, uh, named NANT, a hybrid uh, level side from tracking method, we don't really use a uh, mass conservation equation. Instead, we update the density uh, with the phase indicator. It causes huge problem uh, when dealing with high density ratio flow, which will be uh, shown later. Uh, even for the flux based uh, volume of fluid methods, the consistency cannot uh, be preserved when only solving the volume fraction uh, equation um, and using it uh, to update the density. Uh, 
this will be stressed uh, in part two. And, and the inconsistency effect is like a, a parasitic currents. It can result in artificial acceleration. If the issue impacts your research, many depends on the research area. It perhaps impacts uh, when the emphasis is on uh, dealing with convection dominated flows uh, with no effect of uh, viscosity or on the problem uh, in which viscosity takes care of the stability and the inconsistency error uh, might impact uh, occurrence. occurrence. Yeah. Okay, let me uh, introduce first the positive uh, impact of mass flux consistency on our previous NANT method. In this method, the uh, interface involves with the moving vertices. Uh, originally, the cell center densities are updated uh, directly by the single field formulation. We utilize a geometric method to uh, approximate the surface density, um, the surface uh, area that is submerged in one fluid is calculated. And the ratio of the submerged area to the whole face area is regarded as the alpha f. Then we updated the cell face density uh, with the new f. We proposed a general procedure to update consistent uh, density and, and uh, implemented it on on the land method firstly. Uh, there is uh, no modification applied to involving interface and uh, computing the face center density. As to the new cell center density, we update it through the discretized mass conservation equation uh, with the explicit uh, mass flow flux. Then we use the same densities uh, to solve the momentum equation, uh, especially and uh, we uh, should use the uh, same mass flux in the conservative momentum convection term. At last, uh, the density field should be overwritten uh, to prevent the inconsistency between the uh, density field and the phase indicator field. We verified the consistent uh, NANT method with the cases we described before. That's a droplet uh, translates with the ambient flow. Two kinds of case are tested, uh, one without viscous force and the surface tension, another considering uh, these two terms. In both cases, um, gradient of pressure is still on the right-hand side of the momentum conservation equation. The pressure field is initialized as a zero field. Uh, any velocity error will result in a non-zero pressure and in fact the divergence-free condition. Uh, we use the, the infinite uh, error norm to uh, evaluate the results. It demonstrates the mm, max uh, relative duration between the computed uh, velocity and the analytical velocity, uh, we expect uh, zero value. And for the case uh, ignoring uh, uh, exerted forces, the velocity should keep constant. However, the error norm uh, explodes rapidly uh, for density ratio greater than one. On the contrary, uh, when applying the consistent method, we got the expected uh, results. The error keeps zero uh, strictly over time. The similar uh, improvement can be observed in the case with uh, uh, viscosity and the surface tension. The explosion uh, in the density ratio higher than one uh, removed uh, by using the uh, consistent method. Uh, okay, let's discuss about the influence of uh, the uh, mass flux consistency on volume of fluid method. On screen, three equations are listed as the starting points. Uh, they are the definition of the vol uh, volume fraction, the integral advection uh, equation of the volume fraction and the mass uh, within a control volume omega c. Okay, uh, integrate the uh, mass equation over time uh, Tn to uh, Tn plus one and substitute the volume fraction definition equation. 
and we have the equation 19. Uh, it denotes the equivalence between the uh, density and the scaled uh, volume fraction. It looks uh, intuitive uh, from the equivalence. It seems that the volume fraction equation should be able to uh, replace the mass equation uh, to complete the mass flux consistency uh, we uh, mentioned before. However, despite the equivalence, uh, many works uh, still re reported numerical inconsistency when only solving the uh, volume fraction equation. The reason behind is that uh, the derivation deri above uh, is exact and contains no information uh, of the numerical discretization. We discretize them and the two the two advection uh, equations and have the equation 20 and uh, equation 21. From the two uh, discretized equation, we can notice the two origins uh, of the inconsistency. The first uh, is the integral computation of uh, mass flux zo f and ff from the integral uh, value uh, vf alpha is called the flux uh, phase specific volume. And another reason uh, is the density uh, truncation errors uh, do not cancel out with the scaled uh, fraction error. When explicit Euler and Gossard wind schemes are used, the equivalence are be, uh, can be ensured. However, when it comes to the uh, Kronk Nicholson scheme, the problem arises. We want to uphold the equality uh, between the mass flux and the scaled uh, VF alpha, but it's difficult because the new time interface cannot be uh, evaluated uh, with the new time will. Uh, new time velocity, v plus, v n plus one. In addition, the mass flux is altered in the pressure velocity coupling uh, by applying the uh, flux limiting schemes. To verify this, we implement the aforementioned general consistent method uh, on the inter -iso form, and we call the modified solver inter -iso -zo form. Uh, in the first ver uh, verification, we tested the same translating droplet case uh, with uh, invasive droplet and no surface tension. We set uh, the blending factor of crank nicholson to uh, 0 0.9 as shown. So when keeping the uh, mass flux consistency, the errors decrease from uh, around 0 0.004. Uh, from the interizo form uh, to magnitude of one e minus thirteen, so from uh, the modified the interizo zo form. Uh, another case is uh, that a uh, high density uh, droplet translates in the quotient flow uh, with unit density. The density ratio is a uh, minimum. Uh, it's one minute, it's uh, really high. So the impact of gravity, viscosity, and the surface tension is not uh, considered. We adopted uh, two quantities to evaluate the results. The first one uh, indicates the uh, mass conservation, and the second one indicates the kinetic uh, conservation. Uh, since there is no source or sink, uh, these two quantities should be equal to one and uh, theoretically. Two groups of case, uh, cases are tested, one with Euler scheme and an other with blended uh, crank nicholson scheme. The blended factor is 0 0.9. When using Euler with Gossard wind, we can see the inter form and inter form uh, have very similar good performance. The mass uh, is conservative strictly and only small dissipation of kinetic energy show up. The results correspond to our conclusions that when using Euler plus uh, upwind, the scaled uh, volume fraction equation is equivalent uh, to the mass equation. So the uh, mass flux consistency can be guaranteed when only solving a uh, volume fraction, like uh, what interizo form does. When deploying the uh, blended crank Nicholson temporal scheme, uh, the difference uh, appears. So the uh, results from inter-iso uh, 
zooform keeps stable uh, so over the whole runtime when setting the small CFL numbers. However, the results from inter form explodes under all CFL uh, numbers. Uh, the plots from uh, both the mass uh, and the kinetic energy results uh, show the same trend. We also tested the high density ratio cases with uh, viscosity and the surface tension. Uh, it's evident that there is an abnormal uh, extremal velocity uh, when using original uh, interiso form, uh, which means an unexpected uh, artificial acceleration comes up uh, in interiso form. Uh, inter -iso form uh, results and the velocity field uh, of inter -iso form uh, is much uh, reasonable. Okay, let's go to the conclusion and not look. Mm. In this talk, a uh, consistent method and its uh, implementation on two different uh, two phase flow modeling methods are introduced. For the uh, level side from tracking method, the improvement is significant. And for the flux based uh, VOF uh, method, so it's inter isoform. We can also see the uh, in improvements when using Crown Nicholson scheme. Our preprint uh, of benchmark cases applied with the consistent VOF method and using Euler temporal uh, discretization is in progress. Since the Crown Nicholson scheme in open form shows strong instability when the blending factor is set to one, so we plan to investigate the calculation of the mass flux uh, that is consistent uh, with crank nucleoson scheme or apply operator splitting. Mm -hmm. That's about NodeNIST. I'd like to thank for our team squad and the financial support from the German Research Foundation. Mm, that's all. Thank you for your attention. And I'm open to question now. Oh, sorry. Yeah, thank you, Chun, for this very nice talk. and. You are allowed to applaud. I have the mic switched on. Okay, sir. Okay, I hope you have heard that from Cambridge. <laughs> so the floor is up for discussion. Let me just check also into the chat. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the online attendees, please uh, just write your questions to the chat. Um, are there any questions here? Yeah, just. Thanks. Uh, thank you for the presentation. So you showed us how uh, inter mm -hmm. foam compares with mm -hmm. uh, your new solver in terms of uh, mm -hmm. accuracy. I was wondering mm -hmm. how they compare in terms of computational expense. Mm, expense, uh, I think, yeah, I think uh, when we uh, solve, uh, uh, yeah, it means we, we have solved an uh, accelerate uh, density equation. So the cost, uh, so we, Paid more cost, uh, much cost, uh, much cost, more cost for these computations. But uh, since until now we have only tested for the, these small uh, cases, so the cost is not the difference of cost is not so uh, apparent. So Tomislav, please, you raise the hand. Yeah, thanks. Can, can you hear me? No. Okay. So yeah, I mean, uh, the, the density equation that, that we solve um, is uh, solved exactly. So we, we uh, basically, I'm not kind of counting on any significant computational overhead. Yeah, because you, you calculate these um, mass fluxes uh, using data that you already have in inter -isoform, these area fraction values. And the density equation is just like one more um, additional scalar transport equation. So you have to just solve, solve one more scalar transport equation, nothing else. So it's not, not that costly. Okay, so we have one more question, please. Just one more small question. Uh, you said you did the comparison with inter isoform. So mm -hmm. did you use the uh, standard ISO at vector ISO alpha formulation or did you use the new one that is maybe not in the official releases that is the inter ISO form with the ISO at vector with the plic RDF formulation for the reconstruction, I mean. Mm, so we don't uh, modify the reconstruction part of 
uh, into ESO form. We just uh, ate the uh, density uh, equation, so we need it's a standard version, I guess, then, but uh, yeah, the yeah, problem is also more fundamental, you see. So, mm. I mean, the approach to solution shows to a more fundamental problem. Okay, so I look at the clock. We still have time for questions. So I look around in the audience. Online participants, please. Just give you a couple of minutes for typing. So nothing pops up on screen and also no further questions in the audience. So let's thank the speaker again for this very good talk. Oh, oh there's a question in the Q and A. Okay. No, now things become, Vova, okay. <laughs> Whoever wrote that, Chiara, can you, can you read it out? I don't have the Vova app, you know, open in that, in that in, um, oh. section. Yeah, yeah, sure, can you hear me? Thank you. We make it a bit interactive now. <laughs> yeah, so it says, hello, June. Thanks for a great yeah. talk. I was having difficulty with simulating capillary number less than 10 to the power of minus four. How about interisofoam and or interisofoam? Uh, maybe I can show. I think it's no problem because uh, we we have set the same uh, time restriction for the uh, uh, for the capillary, capillary number as uh, smaller than uh, ten hoch, uh, minus four. Yeah, we have test. I think it's no problem to simulate such a a, a problem. No. Uh, yes, my name is Matthias Rauter. Um, what I will present to you today is my is the last part of my PhD thesis from the University of Oslo. Now I'm back at the University of Innsbruck. And yeah, so I have a lot of affiliations around here. And yeah, a little bit about the motivation behind this work. And right now I'm sitting in Northern Italy and about one hour from here is this uh, old Vaillant dam. And it was built in the 1960s to generate uh, already back then green uh, energy. And on the left, you can see a aerial picture of the dam and behind the dam, you see uh, the artificial lake. And on the right, you see a sketch of the geological situation that you had back then. Uh, you see down here was a small river and then on the side there were two layers of different soil. Below you had a very permeable layer where water could penetrate easily and above that you had a layer of dense material that water could not penetrate. And as soon as they were building the dam and the water level increased, water was penetrating uh, this slope and the water pushed up the slope on top of it. And at one night, the whole mountain collapsed and it fell into the lake. And it generated, of course, a quite sizable wave that overtopped the dam by about 200 meters. And right below the dam, there was a village called Longerone and 2000 inhabitants died due to this accident. So, of course, we are now building more and more such dams. There are a lot already standing. And of course, we want to know what happens if something, uh, if some, such an instability uh, is met again. And if we look at the problem, we see it's quite a complex problem. So we have multiple phases. There is, of course, the two-phase system that represents the wave. So we have water and air. We have, in addition, the soil and sometimes even multiple soil types. Uh, we have complex surface waves, and that's a very important point. Maybe not so much uh, in this group I'm speaking right now, but usually we're using the shallow water equations to simulate waves. And of course, we cannot do this here because we have very complex surface waves. We have breaking waves and so on. So we have to go to a 3D solution. 
Um, furthermore, we have a plastic and frictionless light. So we have a non-Newtonian viscosity in our simulation and we have pore pressure. In this example, pore pressure, the pressure of the water in the soil pore is very important. And of course, as soon as you have pore pressure, you, have, you need, of course, to simulate the fluid that is going through the pores. So you have also porous flow in your simulation. And that, of course, involves permeability. And we tried to find an, uh, a good method with open foam three years ago to simulate this whole process chain. And with one thing we started was the rheological model for the soil. And I will exclude this in this presentation. So I will not talk about rheology. We have the rheology for slides for landslides in place in open phone and can use it for all solvers. It's just a, a viscosity model. But of course, the question then comes up, which flow model should we use? Um, and there are different possibilities to choose. And the first one, the first possibility that we started to look into was multiphase interphone. And we have multiple components. Sometimes it's called multiple phases. But I like to distinguish here now in this talk between components and between phases. And here I speak of components because these are phases that don't have their own velocity. So components always move with, uh, uh, with the same velocity. And therefore, they can also not mix. They are immiscible. And the reason if, is if they move with the same velocity, uh, they cannot mix and unmix except for numerical issues. And that, of course, also gives us a sharp interface. And what you see here on the right is, of course, the ordinary Navier-Stokes equation. And we will then track our components with these markers, with these uh, component indicators or phase indicators. And we have, of course, here the time derivative, the convection term. And then we have this interface compression term that keeps the interface sharp. And based on these indicators, we then calculate the local density and the local viscosity, and we have a nice simulation. And of course, this compression term, this compression velocity is formulated in such a way that the interface is kept sharp. Um, but there is in open foam uh, an additional, a different family of solvers, namely the Euler foam family. And here you have multiple wheel phases. And why do I speak here of wheel phases? Because each phase has its own velocity. So the phases, they can mix, they can unmix, and so on. And here you then see again the Navier-Stokes equations. You have the divergence free. So all velocities combined uh, are, of course, divergence free. And then we have a momentum conservation equation for each phase. And again, we can track these phases with here the uh, temporal derivative, a convection term, and again, an interface compression term, which we might use or not use. And as I showed here already, this is a really good solver for granular flows. And the reason is that granular flows, they always have a pore space. And this pore space, it can, it can expand, it can contract, and the rheology will be really, really sensitive to this. And in Euler form, we can simulate this and the rheology can predict this sensitivity. Um, so let's see what happens if we use these two solvers. And for that, we used uh, quite, yeah, quite a common setup of, of experiments from the year 2013. And it's just a tank, uh, it's filled with water down here and on this slope, we have a little bit of sand. We have some doors. We have some doors that are opened. The sand will fall into the water and generate a wave. And of course, this is a very easy uh, experiment to set up with Interfoam. We have here, uh, we have down here the water. We have up here the sand and here the air. And all the interfaces are here marked by a black line. So we have sharp interfaces between all our components. On the left, you see 
uh, pictures of the experiment with here the sand and down here the water. And as the simulation starts, you see that the simulation is much, much slower than the experiment, especially here in this picture, you see it. And also you see that water is penetrating the slide. And of course, with Interform, you cannot show this, you cannot simulate this. And about here, you see the final, uh, the final situation in the simulation. And even the slide didn't reach the final one out. And the reason that this happened is the, air, the water pressure is pushing the slide towards the slope. And because of the granular rheology, the viscosity increases to very high values and the slide will not completely fall into the water. Um, the, wave is, um, is the wave is similarly bad, it's way, way too low. So we cannot use this in practice. Um, how does it look with multiphase Euler foam? And here you see we have no just no sharp interfaces anymore. And we really have this mixture that's dynamic and changing at all times. So I really needed this three-dimensional color bar to represent the mixture of water blue, air white, and grains red. And you can see the, the simulation looks already much, much better. The slide is much faster. The wave looks a little bit weird. Uh, I will come to that later. The runout is approximately fine, but especially here you see a lot of weird artifacts in the, in the surface wave that is supposed to represent the tsunami. And of course, that gives some weird feedback on the slide. So also here, it's not quite working properly. And we tried a lot with the solver, but we came to the conclusion that also multiphase Euler foam is not working properly for our purposes. Um, so let's see how the solvers were doing. So with Interfoam, of course, we have no permeability, we have no granular rheology, no proper granular rheology, but we have a sharp water surface and the wave is represented quite well and its the diffusivity is quite low. We showed this in a different paper, just the wave, not the slide. And multiphase Euler foam, on the other hand, it's this permeability and granular rheology works quite nicely. So we were quite happy with that. We again showed this in a, a publication on its own. But the water wave was really, really diffusive and we lost a lot of wave energy. So again, it was not practical to use. So how to fix it? And at that point, we thought the best way to fix it is to combine these models. And the idea was to take Euler foam and in the pore space of the slide, use an interfoam model. And of course, outside of the slide, the pore volume is one, is 100%, and the solver falls back to an ordinary interfoam. Um, so that might give us the night gran nice granular rheology features and the permeability features, but on the other hand, also the nice sharp and non-diffusive water-air interface. Um, so how does this look in the code? And what you see here is the multiphase system of multiphase interform. And you just have a lot of phases in there, as many as you want. And they all have this phi, which gives you the phase fraction of this phase. So how much the phase is up, how much space the phase is occupying, and of course the velocity. Uh, but all the density are constants. And when you then call solve, all the velocities and all the phase fractions get updated, more or less, a little bit simplified. Um, so we changed it now. And we used the multi-phase system, but each phase was now a multi-component system, which is actually the multi-phase system that I was dealing from Interfoam. So each phase has multiple components and the components now have constant viscosities and, uh, and the multi-component system affects the alphas, these component indicator functions like Interfoam does. And then the density of the phases is not a constant anymore, but it's actually a function that calculates the density in the same way Interfoam does. 
Um, of course, in, outside of the systems, the solver had to change by uh, in some places, but overall, it was actually not so difficult to change and due to the really nice code structure that's already in place. So coming to the model in terms of mathematics, how it looks when you write down the equations, here simplified for just uh, one granular phase and one continuous phase that is split up into two components, namely water and air. So we have here the multiphase model of Euler form. Then we put in here uh, this equation that tracks how much water and air is in the pores. This gives us the viscosity and the density of the pore fluid. And then, of course, we have a little bit of granular rheology. Again, this is kind of well known by now, so not so difficult, so we'll not go into much detail today. And with this, we could go back to our test case, to the experiments of Virolet. And you see now here, I represent it in such a way that we have no sharp interface around the granular phase, but we have, of course, a sharp interface between the air and the water components. Um, otherwise, again, I have can have various mixtures, and that's why, again, I need this two-dimensional color um, bar. And when I play the simulation, you see the slide is falling into water and a quite sharp um, water-air interface is now penetrating to the slide and a nice sharp wave uh, is generated and attracted away from the point of impact. And some air bubbles keep flowing up and I really, really like this picture because this is the final one out and you see a lot of details here, like, for example, these two different slopes here with the nice bump here. So the results were really, really good. And you can also see it in the wave. So in the experiment, the wave height has been measured at four different points. And the, the simulation matched the wave at most of these points quite well. And this is especially nice because we don't need it to, uh, to, to optimize any parameters. So all the parameters were known and we could get this as a real prediction, which was not done, uh, which was not done before in this community. So this is one of the first real prediction without a posteriori fitting of material parameters. And with that, we could go to a real application. And of course, we could have simulated Vaillant, but uh, it's a little bit too easy because there is no good documentation. The event happened 50 years ago, and the possibilities to document an event were not so good by then. Um, in 2014, however, a similar event happened. And that was in Lake Askia in Iceland. And uh, the slope of a, of a caldera, of a former volcan that's now a, a lake, collapsed and fell into the sea. And you can see here the scar from the slide and down here the deposition. And it was very highly, uh, highly accurately documented uh, thanks to modern technology like drones and aerial photography, but also we were kind of lucky because it snowed the day before the event and the wave washed away the snow. So the uh, inundation of the wave could, um, could be found very exactly the day after. And we simulated this in full 3D and we used a mesh with 30 million cells. Uh, meshing was really, really hard. Uh, I used CF mesh to mesh this and I can really uh, give you that as a tip. If you ever have to mesh the rain, CF mesh is really good at that. And then we simulated it on a high performance cluster for quite some time. And here are the results. First of all, a nice 3D view. Here I show the slide velocity in blue to yellow and the elevation of the lake is shown in blue to red. And you see the slide accelerating quite rapidly up to 60 meters per second and then falling into the lake and generating a wave with 
25 to 30 meters height that is traveling across the lake and producing inundation on all sides. And of course, we then had to compare our simulation with the field observation. And you see here in gray, the documented inundation from the field, so where the snow was washed away. And in blue, you see the simulation, the open foam simulation. Um, the open foam simulation tends to be to overestimate the inundation on the north side and underestimate the inundation on the south side. And we think uh, this is the case because we did not quite get the fate default of the slide correctly. And therefore the slide tended a little bit towards the north and generated the higher inundation there. But overall, it's quite a good match. And last but not least, we can also compare with the field data and the simulated inundation with uh, previous uh, simulations with shallow water equations. Uh, here I show the elevation height. So that is the height of the highest point of the inundation in around the lake, as it's a little bit easier to compare the simulations in this view. And if you compare our simulation with the previous simulations, you see that they are approximately equal how they fit to the observation. And this is Again, I think quite impressive because the previously the simulations were always fitted to match the inundation. We had no real way to simulate it from failure to inundation. And we could do that and we actually managed to get approximately the same amount of accuracy. Um, so if you want to find out more about this work, uh, we wrote a paper about it. Uh, it was published in Nature Communications and we were very happy about it. Uh, I think it's very nice for the whole community that Open Forum was published in a journal with quite a big audience and not only numeric sky, but also a very diverse audience. So we were really, really happy about this. And here you find more videos. We have a very, very, big list of additional material where you find more details about the model and meshes and so on. Um, coming to conclusions and here from an open phone point of view, so leaving away all the geoscience stuff. So what this work really showed me is that different, different flows, we need different numerics and different methods. Um, here it's very obvious with the slide and the wave that are completely different. They really need their own numerics. And that brings me also to the point that I don't think there is one, one size fits all solution for complex processes in CFD. Um, but here comes in the power of open foam. And open form is customizable and most parts are somewhere. I just put parts together, interform a little bit, oil form a little bit, and boom, we have a new solver for a new problem. And last but not least, I want to say that it was really nice to work with mules. The documentation is basically non-existing, but if you find out a little bit how it works, and how the function calls are structured. It's really nice to work with. It works in Euler form, it works in Interform, it works when you combine them. And that was really, really pleasure to work with. And it didn't take me long to actually write this all over. The, all the work went into running and visualizing the simulations basically. So a really nice experience from an open form point of view. And that's it. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm a little bit sad I cannot be in person, but I hope I will be there the upcoming years. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Matthias. I hope you heard it. Thank you for the nice talk. And it's up for discussion. Let me also maybe go again into the chat and open it. So are there any questions? Yes.
Yeah, first of all, thanks for the talk. Uh, quite interesting. Um, I was wondering if the, so, so you say you have a sharp interface and you have three phases. And I was wondering if the density gradients across the, the interfaces uh, are kind of screw up your results or, or how you treat those gradients. Um, we started actually with just simulating water and air and used interfoam for that and interisofoam. Um, interisofoam and uh, interfoam did um, more or less equally well. We then stuck to interfoam because we thought it would be easier to integrate with oiler foam. And so we are using the complete standard treatment. Uh, there and there it works uh, quite nicely. Um, but of course, I know of all the issues that Interform has, um, but none of them seem to be too severe for us. Uh, when it comes to Euler foam, I think the problem is that if you have a sharp interface, you completely you completely use inertia of one phase on the opposite side of the phase. And then all you have are these like artificial numerical terms that keep your simulation running. And I think that makes sharp interfaces quite problematic with this Euler foam concept, where you kind of have a water velocity in the air uh, phase and the air velocity in the water phase. So I hope that <laughs> uh, addresses your question. <laughs> I think there is some further need of discussion looking at the face. You, you can't see it. But I, I would suggest you, you meet on the Vova app and maybe you can exchange there as well. So I want to leave the floor for further questions. OK. This one, just a second. <clears throat> uh, maybe a, like more sort of isoteric question away from open foam, but I'm aware that, you know, when you do the experiments, you'll have a large distribution of particles, or typically you will. And in open foam, I presume it's somewhat uniform. And I was wondering how you might compare the two, like how that might ex affect your validation. Would you expect it to be better if you could replicate it more accurately? Just because um, I don't yes. see granular flows. So. <laughs> Uh, right now, uh, the experiments were done with uh, particles of equal size, so we call them monodispersed granular flows. Uh, so in the experiment, it worked very well. Uh, when it comes to uh, polydispersed granular flows, so when there are particles of different size in there, um, we actually wrote an open foam, open foam solver for that too. Uh, in the in the simulations I showed now, of course, the natural occurring landslide has particles of different size, but there are in geoscience, there are some equations or some laws which grain size determines the permeability um, of a material. Um, these are the so-called filter laws from Terzaghi, and we used those to kind of estimate an effective diameter that would give us the right amount of permeability. And uh, it seemed to work. Of course, it's uh, not the nicest way to deal with it, um, but it seemed to work. It's an easy solution, but we are also trying to, uh, uh, to uh, write solvers for polydispersed granular flows. Yeah, so thumbs up for that answer, <laughs> Matthias. We have a question Thank in the you. online audience. Any comments on the dust that emanates uh, from the sand slide? Uh, yes, of course, uh, there is some dust, which is mostly a result of the granular phase getting a very low, uh, getting a low uh, phase fraction and being pulled up in the air, and then it's holed up in the air by uh, by the drag forces. And we see it in the simulation. So we see this layering of a dense core and kind of a powder cloud above it. But it uh, is it is not as 
pronounced as we would, as you often observe it in nature. And this comes then back to the, to the fact that we use only one particle size, and that is that the small particles, they can usually keep up in the air for much, much longer. So if you want to really see some dust, a powder cloud, you really have to use uh, kind of two granular phases uh, where one of them has a much, much smaller grain diameter than the others. So one will stay airborne while the other is creating, is building this dense flow. And again, yeah, we work on it. I know uh, a group in Manchester that is quite intensively working on this. And we will see if we can simulate that a little bit better in the future. Okay, thank you, Matthias. We have a further question. Any comment on the mesh quality generated with CF mesh on the heel surface and interface? Um, it was a little bit complicated with <laughs> CF mesh to to get a to get a to get. Uh, uh, exactly a uh, uh, cell wall at the resting lake. We found that was quite important to not get ripples in the lake before the slide fell into it. Uh, otherwise, the mesh quality was very, very good, we found. Uh, we tried also with snappy hex mesh. And maybe it's just because snappy hex mesh is harder to control, but we found much more success with CF mesh. And the mesh quality was, uh, was good considering the, considering the problem that you have to mesh what you got. Like you have not nice curves, you just, ha just have a laser scan with some points that you have to mesh. And for that, it was really good. Uh, Check mesh was happy. The solver was happy. So I was happy too. Okay, we have one, one more question. We have still time. So I jump over. Uh, thank you for uh, your talk. Uh, I have a question about, you talked about uh, a delay in the simulation uh, uh, in respect uh, with the experiments. Uh, this uh, delay was more similar to an initial time offset uh, or more similar to a slow motion uh, film of the experiment. And uh, at the end, uh, you showed uh, the plot uh, of the waves uh, and uh, seemed to recreate very well uh, the time uh, uh, dependence of the wave. So you added a post-processing correction or with your new method, uh, you have avoided uh, this uh, problem related with this delay. Thank you. Um, we used now, uh, so in the, in the, for the plot of the wave time signal, we used, we defined as t equals zero, the simulation start. So also in open form t equals zero and the time of opening the gate where the sign fell out. So I think the reasonable thing to do. So we applied no correction there. Um, when it comes to the slide being too slow, so it was too slow in our opinion. Um, there are some aspects. First of all, it's way, way too slow with interfoam. That's because the friction is too high because the water is pushing the slide on the slope. So that's just a very big modeling error. Uh, when it then comes to this custom solver that we use, the slide is still a little bit too slow. And that might, that might be to do to some small mismatch of some empirical functions in there, like the drag functions. So if the drag is too big, of course, the slide is slowed down quicker in the simulation than in reality. But at the same time, since the drag is higher, the wave is then, uh, is then bigger. If the drag is higher, the wave is bigger. So these effects, they cancel out each other. The slide is a little bit too slow. It's in the tens of a meter per second, so not very much. And this arrow does not fully propagate to the wave. So that's how we have, that's why we have quite a, quite a nice wave signal. 
in short, not all slide error translates one to one to the wave. Okay. Okay. Once again, a good a good day to everyone. Thank you for being here. It's nice to hear that there's, there's such a large crowd. Uh, it's a bit stressful, but I hope I can manage. So, uh, my name is Ben. I'm a research fellow at the Singapore Institute of Technology. And my talk today is titled Large Scale Water Jet Trajectory and Breakup Excited by Air. So I'm presenting on behalf of my, my colleagues and, and my team at uh, SIT in partnership with the Home Team Science and Technology Agency. So, so for those of you wondering what the Home Team uh, Agency is, is basically the agency that governs research and developments for, uh, for government bodies like the police force and uh, firefighters, the civil defense. So, um, this is the presentation outline. It's fairly straightforward. We begin off with my introduction and motivation for, for the project, uh, the research objectives, some of the numerical methodology, of course, uh, for open foam, which involves uh, VOF plus AMR for interface capturing. Uh, we go through some of the results and observations for different uh, water nozzle configurations. We'll talk more about that later and the future work. So moving on to the introduction, uh, a simple water jet, right, released from a water monitor, possesses a very much complex physical behavior in its trajectory as it develops the air. So, uh, although analytical models, right, can provide sufficient uh, description of these statistics, being things like uh, the height, the throw, basically a, a parabola, they are. These models are, of course, uh, limited to to experimentally controlled conditions, and furthermore, the the behavior, right, that. Uh, that this that this water water jet or, or water interface that, that goes through the air is dominantly driven by by a function of uh, breakup point and droplet distribution. So basically, what I'm trying to say is the the Fraun and Weber numbers uh, can actually affect the type of behavior that we observe as the as the water jet goes through the air, uh, which in turn can be quite challenging to de determine, depending on what appropriate models we want to choose. So. Uh, yeah, like I said, so this is given that a spectrum of Fraun and Weber number exists throughout this flow field, right? Uh, that is driven by the breakage of surface tension and droplet uh, coalescence at the same time. So the present study that we're looking at is still highly applied CFD. And in this case, or this project, we use open foam to try and model this behavior. So uh, the, the project that we're working on is largely inspired by systems that you see over here on the right. Let me get the laser pointer up, sorry. Okay, so these are the two systems that uh, we are largely inspired by, uh, among many others, of course. So uh, on the top here, we see something like uh, aerosolization or atomization of, of, a, of, a, of a fluid. I suppose this is water that is being blown out by a, a fan, right? And over the one at the bottom, we see two water monitors. It's a bit hard to see because the picture is quite small. Uh, we see two water monitors that are actually dispersing water into the atmosphere and it's largely excited by uh, what, I, what we think is a gas turbine. Uh, located underneath it. So now uh, the motivation for our work lies in the existing that these systems right can have practical uh, applications or solutions whereby these the atomization of aerosolization of this uh, water through the air can can help uh, you know of course help maybe extinguish a fire or help uh, fight some kind of a hazard that is taking place. So but however for modeling and simulation right the the augmentation of this water jet uh, including the air or jet stream uh, inevitably complicates the underlying physics. So if you have a water jet on its own, that's largely fine. Uh, if you have an air jet on its own, then that's also fine. But once you combine the two, then this is where things start to get a little bit more complicated. So even then, uh, knowing the flow conditions, determining the type of flow regime that uh, that we are we are trying to look at can be quite can be quite challenging to determine, right? Whether it's a type one uh, stratified flow or a type four. Uh, atomization flow, but of course, with the existing pictures that we see on the top, uh, we know that it's largely maybe a type three or four kind of flow where the where the fluid completely breaks up and atomizes. So yeah, because of that, uh, a wide range of flow regimes is expected to exist, and not not to mention also it it's highly dependent on the geometry they're looking at. So if the water monitor is an annular geometry versus a circular a clean circular geometry, uh, that would largely affect the type of flow conditions that we are. Uh, we are expecting. So because of all these things considered, uh, choosing an appropriate model is, is fairly challenging. Well, challenging for me at least. So I must say that uh, 
in the realm of multi-phase flows, right? I'm practically a child, so I I have very little experience with uh, multi-phase flows. So please guide me along if if you can. Thank you. <laughs> and now moving on to our research objectives. So we uh we we would like to basically just explore what what kind of methods uh, would give us the best representation of the physics that we are that we are looking for. So uh, to to better simulate uh, these existing practical solutions, right? We are looking at three different uh, case scenarios. So first is a single water monitor where we just have a, a typical firefighter uh, water nozzle, followed by a double water monitor whereby if you look at the geometry at the top right. We turn off the air jet, which is the one at the bottom, and only keep the two water nozzles on. And we let them, they are angled slightly together, actually, so that they sort of impinge on each other. And then thirdly, we have the full case, what we call the full case, where we have the double water monitor on with a single jet as an exciter. So uh, what you're seeing here on this, this big cloud here is actually the instantaneous result. Uh, what, more on that later. So I, I must say that this project is still very early in its inception. So we just started. Uh, sometime this year. And uh, we, we try to use whatever existing methods that OpenFORM has uh, to help capture this, this behavior. OK, so now on to the numerical approach. So of course, we use OpenFORM as the, as the solver of choice. Uh, and, and depending on what level of approximation that, that, we, want to, uh, that, we, that we want to choose, uh, we have gone first with uh, InterFORM, uh, which is uh, volume of fluid method, a VOF method that's uh, focused on capturing the, in this case, air water uh, phase fraction. So I understand that Interform comes with its own uh, concerns and considerations. Uh, like, but like I said, this is still something that we are still exploring. Uh, along the lines in our timeline, we are also considering exploring things like an uh, Lagrangian method. So if we are expecting complete atomization of, of the water that comes out from the nozzle, then uh, then we then we'll probably go for something like that. And also there are other, uh, of course, I'm sure many of you would know uh, other multi-phase mod methods like thin field modeling, which may not be so appropriate in our case. So for our case, we will do a simulation of a water jet that's really choose, released through the air at an inclination angle uh, of about 30 degrees, about more on that later. And we use the VOF method coupled with LES and AMR to better capture water droplets of a given size and volume fraction based on the AMR resolution. So now moving on to our numerical methodology. Uh, like I said, we are using the, we are using the Interform solver that is based on the Navier-Stokes equations for two incompressible isothermal immiscible fluids. So the grids are generated with uh, block mesh and snappy hex mesh, fairly typical. And what you see over here on the right is the geometry, the tri-nozzle geometry that I shown earlier. And it's located inside the domain, elevated at a certain height of the ground. So the entire domain is, is the background mesh, uh, for one, is created with block mesh. And uh, we did a little bit of a cell grading to concentrate the cells towards the nozzle, because relative to the background mesh, the nozzles uh, are quite small and difficult to actually refine and capture properly. So uh, that's one challenge that we faced. And on top of that, uh, we had we also had to use AMR to help uh, the interface capture as the as the plume actually develops uh, along the length and width of, of this domain. So the, all the sides of the domain are, are ambient. So the, the fluid is allowed to freely just uh, fall through the air. So over here, you see are the schemes that we have used. Uh, we, at, the, at present, we have not done any kind of uh, scheme sensitivity studies. Um, we are still planning for an experiment that is coming up early next year, which, we had, which then we were able to compare the results that we have today uh, with that. So for, but for simulation wise, uh, these are the settings. And throughout the simulation, we constantly monitor for the conservation of the phase fraction and the interface crew number which is kept no more than a maximum of 0 0.8. So this is a fixed time step uh, that achieves a crew number of no more than 0 0.8. OK, so now moving on to my next slide. Uh, this is a video. But before I play the video, so uh, this is uh, some initial results of the single water monitor case, the case one that I was talking about. So this is a water jet uh, with an inlet, this little blue patch that you see at a 45 degree uh, angle. Sorry, this is a, 
this, this point B and point C are separate case studies. So for this case, it's just only the water jet. There is no air jet. And then we simulate up to about two seconds of simulated flow time. The nozzle diameter is 0 0.1 meters and the fluid uh, is exiting at about 10 meters per second. So if I may play the video, uh, this is what it looks like. Hmm? Why is it not playing? Ah, there we go. Okay, so uh, yeah, it's a, it's a fairly quick video, but I think it, it proves that uh, to a certain degree, uh, this is what we are looking for. Whether or not the method is the best method available, uh, I think that is definitely still debatable. Uh, so yeah, we see a very nice uh, jet that's water jet that's coming out. Uh, this is contoured by velocity magnitude. So rate is about 10 meters per second. And then we see the water starts to break up and convert to a different flow regime. So we start to see things like uh, ligamentation and of course droplets, large water droplets start to form. So as we know that uh, the VOF method is inherently dependent on, on the ability for the grid to capture the, the interface. So this is where uh, we chose to implement AMR on top of on top of that. And this is another video of the AMR in action of the same results. So what we are seeing here is the again the same water interface uh, relative to the background grid uh, that is being used to refine as as the water jet goes through the air. So so this is these are the resolution of about five percent the fractional volume. So uh, it's this AMR refines uh, up to two levels of uh, octree based refinement based on the snappy hex mesh or, or block mesh, uh, background mesh. And then, uh, yeah, two levels with a time accuracy of uh, less, than, less than one. So, in terms of absolutes, we are looking at a background grid of 0 0.05 meters with a refined grid. After two levels of refinement, we see it reduced to 0 0.0125 meters. So, in this case, the cell count is. It begins at approximately 300,000 and then increases to uh, about 1.5 million due to that, that, AMR, uh, that AMR refinement. Okay, so just let me play the video again. Yep, so this is the, the, the interface going through the air. And moving on to our other case studies, uh, we, we also look at uh, the other two case, the other two cases B and C, which is where we include uh, a two water jet configuration as well as the third one where we include the air nozzle. So this is a tri nozzle configuration. Uh, the dimensions here are, for now, are, are are basically arbitrary. There's no particular reasoning why we choose this this given spacing or this given diameters. Uh, but of course, when it comes to the experiment, we will try to mimic these dimensions as closely as we can. Uh, but I think I'll, I'll talk more on that later because we, we are facing some challenges with that. So now the, the first case that we look at is the twin water nozzle jet. Uh, so basically to, to, to observe their impinging behavior as the two water nozzles or the two water jets uh, touch each other. And then another case, a uh, with and without air excitation to assess the, the impact of the air jet on water behavior. So of course, for practical reasons, we want to find out if you know an air nozzle implemented into a system like that can help augment uh, whatever purpose is, is it will be used for. So moving on to the results for the two water nozzles. Uh, this is, we did multiple studies for this at different uh, inlet speeds. So, but basically to assess uh, the behavior and also set this up for our future experiment because something like that is, is fairly easy to set up. Uh, we just need two nozzles and then we observe the behavior accordingly. But unfortunately, uh, I don't have those comparisons yet. Hopefully, we can submit that to something like the Open Form Journal soon. So this is for a two nozzle case. And uh, moving on to the effect of the air jet on the water plume. So what you are seeing here is a side view and the top view with an air on and an air off configuration. So uh, I'll just play the video, and I think the result will speak for itself. So of course, this becomes uh, much more intensive to compute uh, because of the inherently higher crew numbers that we expect based on the, the injection of the, the gas turbine. Okay, so, so the results on the top rows are with the air on. 
So let me just pause it at the last frame. Yep, so the results for the top are with the air on condition where uh, air is, ex is used to impart momentum into, into the water jet. And the one at the bottom is fairly, fairly similar or comparable to the one we saw before where it's just two water nozzles coming in with the air turned off. Right, so clearly we can see that there's some justification for having a, a, a gas turbine located beneath uh, this, this system. So with, with that, we are able to see things like, uh, we're able to observe uh, some physics involved, like how the air actually interacts with the water jet uh, and how it, of course, further breaks it up. And also uh, the air also helps augment the, the effective spread angle, or we call it the spread angle, to, to determine the effectiveness of, of, this, of this entire system. Okay, so now uh, I just want to show the result in full. So we, this is, as you would expect, this is fairly, whoops, this is fairly uh, intensive to compute. So what we have now is about 2.6 seconds of flow time. Uh, it takes about, it takes about 1.5 weeks for us to compute about one second of flow on a AMD Epic 7743, which is a 64 core, 256 megabyte uh, CPU chip. And we, yeah, we are quite happy to say that, you know, we, we managed to capture something like that. Although, again, this may not be the most appropriate or most economical way to, way to do things. Okay, so, so the summary and impact of our findings here. So at this juncture, we feel like, like the LES or LES VOF AMR combination exhi exhibits some uh, comm commendable behavior, uh, commendable performance in capturing the flow structure. Sorry, there's a bit of a typo here. Uh, although we incur a relatively high computational cost. So like I said, uh, these simulations are conducted on a single node, a single processor, and it takes about 1.5 weeks for one second of flow time for the full case. So for about the 2.6 seconds that you see, it took us about almost a month. Uh, but of course, this is worth noting that as the plume grows bigger, although we are starting with a background grid of about 3.5 million, this grows to something like 15 million as the plume becomes uh, fully developed. So that's where the simulation really starts to slow down and we feel like maybe we, are, we, are, we start to hit a wall. So uh, yeah, and again, whether or not the results are valid, uh, we, are, we are still experimenting. Uh, we, are planning, we are planning for an experiment to take place hopefully by the start of next year. So uh, an experiment work something, for something like that, it can be quite challenging to take to, to conduct. So if you imagine uh, something that gives you a throw, a water jet that gives you a throw of about say 50 to 100 meters, uh, if you've ever been to Singapore, finding a location like that, you know, in such a big city like Singapore can be quite, can be quite difficult to, to organize. So, so that's why, uh, that's something that I feel we could, we could do better on. And so for some considerations and challenges face, so with this LES and AMR approach, right, the scales can of course effectively reach uh, DNS-like levels as you refine the grids or AMR even more and more. Uh, but of course, this becomes extremely computationally intensive and it may not, of course, it's not necessary for us to capture the interface down to the droplet level. So, and then on top of that, the geometry and meshing also presents its own, its own form of challenges. So for, for example, if you look at the the geometry that I shown earlier, uh, the annular shape water monitors, right, are in the order of millimeters, which can be very difficult to mesh and balance uh, with the time step sizes that, that we require. So couple that together with the very small time step sizes and also with the AMR, we is basically a recipe for, for a very, very large impractical case to run. <laughs> and yeah, so I think that that brings me to my last point. So under the, the predetermined, say, 5 to 1% grid scale, right, things get a bit more complicated and difficult to capture. So just for a bit of uh, future work, for my own consideration, actually, or if there's anybody with any comments that could perhaps uh, help to guide me along, uh, we are looking to explore other methods like a multi-phase oil foam. So of course, it's, it becomes a more statistical approach. But if we do not need to actually capture the interface, uh, then VOF might not be that appropriate or that suitable anymore. But at the same time, uh, multi-phase oil foam can help us also give us uh, concentration levels in terms of how much water is, where it has how much water, and also the, the overall size and development of the water plume. Or in fact, even a Lagrangian approach. So like, uh, like I said, if we are expecting the flow to be completely uh, atomized, uh, then a Lagrangian approach 
possibly could be more, more applicable. And also uh, other more advanced methods like VOA of DPM, but I think, I think that is slightly beyond me at the moment. Yeah. So uh, with that, I've come to the end of my presentation. I just want to take a moment to, to thank our collaborators. So our friends from uh, HGX, the Home Team Science Technology Agency, and of course, the, my colleagues at Singapore Institute of Technology. So these are our official websites. If, if you want to, you can just take a look. And last but not least, a big thanks to the open form community and also the open source community. So with that, uh, I think I've come to the end of my presentation. And uh, this is me, I'm Benjamin, this is my email. So uh, feel free to write in if you have any comments or just contact me through the Wuva app. Thank you very much. Thank you, Benjamin. So the floor is up for discussion. And I, I, let me start with maybe a, a chat contribution that, I, that was first. So uh, the question is, have you compared different settings of AMR, various refinement levels and number of layers? Uh, yes, we have, uh, but of course it's not shown there. So we have compared across different degrees of refinement based on the, the level of concentration that we want. So the results that you saw were about five to 1% based on the, the AMR refinement level. We have done things like 10 or even 20%. And at that, at that, at this flow condition, right, we actually do not see the AMR actually doesn't, doesn't work anymore. And we do not actually see the physics that we want to see. So the it basically fails to, to capture the interface that we're looking for. Yeah. So so the moment that the moment the water leaves the nozzle, right, we, we expect to see already a sub a sub 10% concentration level. So anything above that. Uh, we don't we don't see a we don't see a nice result anymore. Mm. As for various refinement levels, then again, yeah. So the one that we you saw is two refinement levels. You could go more, but then with every octree refinement, meaning every half of of the cell, you then exponentially increase your total mesh count. So for our case, it was already fifteen million elements when the plume was fully developed. Uh, I don't think we were comfortable of going any further than that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Are there, are there further questions in the audience, in person audience, I have to say? Yeah, we have one. Um, I was just wondering about the spray. Do you have by chance statistical data of the droplet sizes in the spray? Mm, no. So actually what we are planning to do is to capture the, what we are interested in is the distribution of volume. So like if you were to imagine it like a conical shape, right? We are more interested in, in the water distribution, like the limits of, of the cone versus the height and how the distribution varies with that. In terms of droplet size, no. But I have to say that our AMR resolution is down to 0 0.0125. Uh, if I may just share my screen again. Any, any further questions here? Yes. Yeah, so this is the resolution that we were looking at. So uh, 0 0.0125 meters. Okay, one more question. Uh, yeah, so I have another question with regard to the AMR, uh, but then the, the remeshing time step that you use. Do you remesh on every time step or do you use a certain uh, interval? And if so, how did you choose that interval? Uh, so for, for most of our cases that we have successfully run, it, it ranges from three to five, every three to five time steps. Uh, you could do it every time step. That would be the ideal case, but then that would take up a lot of time. Uh, but in the interest of, of having the, the solution as quickly as possible, we played around with this and we found that five was also the limit. Every five time steps uh, was the limit that, that we... Yeah, that we were comfortable with going before we start to see the results uh, behaving, or, or rather we start seeing the solution behaving very weirdly. So a lot of it is purely trial and error. So there isn't really a, a fixed method of determining these, these numbers, no. Okay, we have one more question here. Yeah, maybe more comment for the first thing I would like to tell you. Um, uh, maybe you, it would be worth a try to, to try the population balance methods in this kind of problems uh, because uh, you, you, have, you can have different sizes of uh, droplets 
and maybe I, I don't know if this would work uh, by, uh, by the way uh, and an, mm -hmm. another question regarding your uh, uh, schemes that you showed uh, on one of the first slides uh, why uh, don't yes. you use the interface compression scheme and the uh, VRB alpha um, that's a tough question I I'm sorry I don't really to be honest with you I don't really have a have a have an answer to that. This is still uh, all fairly new to me, but but thank you for that. I'll I'll take a look into it and and see and see if the results improve. Mostly, yeah, mostly what we use, but maybe in the tutorials they have some in with the ghost linear. But uh, mostly we use the go the interface compression with the uh, interform solver. I see. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, everyone for joining. And big thank you for to everyone who is online. So yeah, I'm myself, Abdul. I'm a PhD student at the School of Mechanical and Materials Engineering at the University College, Dublin. My PhD is supervised by Professor David Brown and Dr. Philip Cardiff. So yeah, uh, my P research is funded by IFO, which is uh, Advanced Manufacturing Research Center under Science Foundation Ireland. So uh, in between IFORM, my research lies in Platform 2, which aims in developing multi-scale, multi-physics computational model to simulate the entire powder with fusion process. So the computational models are being developed using open framework, open form. So the focus of my research work is to develop models at the micro scale length to simulate the solidification during a additive manufacturing process. So uh, this is the outline of my today's presentation. So uh, first I would briefly talk about the phase field method and the governing equations, which will be followed by the results and conclusions. I'd also like to shed some lights on the future aspects of our research and uh, finally, I would like to end my session with some questions from the audience. Okay. So phase field method has recently emerged as a powerful computational tool to simulate the microstructure or more generally to tackle the free boundary problems. So the basic idea in phase field method is that the whole microstructure of the system is defined by an order parameter or field variable, which is either conserved or non-conserved. So quickly understand the phase field method. I would like to refer to figure one here. So suppose there is a precipitate phase or phase one is growing uh, on a matrix phase or zero phase. Okay, so uh, the order parameter or the field variable phi assumes distinct values zero or one at the bulk phases and changes continuously across the interface. And thus it makes the interface diffuse in nature. That's why the phase field models are also known as the diffuse interface models. Now, once the order parameter or the field variable is decided, the temporal evolution can be obtained by either kahn hilliard equation or the ln kahn equation. So one of the important feature of the phase field method is that Unlike the sharp interface models, we do not need to track the interface explicitly. Okay, so as I have mentioned, uh, the governing equation in, uh, in the phase field models are obtained from two very popular equations known as the Allen Kahn equation or the Kahn Hilliard equation. Oh, I don't know, it's not visible. Can you just remove this? Yeah, yeah just, uh, sorry. Yeah, uh, the Kahn Hilliard equation. So, in the Allen Kahn equation, the term phi is a non conserved order parameter which denotes the phase of the system. And in the Kahn Hilliard equation, the C term is a conserved order parameter which, in our case, denotes the composition of the solute phase. The term uh, F that appears in both the equation. Sorry, it's, I think it's out of battery. So I'll just keep on uh, continuing with this one.
Okay, can you? Uh, okay. Okay, uh, so the term F that appears in both the equation is known as free energy functional. So for the Allen Kahn equation, the free energy functional takes the form of Ginzburg Landau free energy, where epsilon is the gradient energy coefficient. The two term functions G and P that appears in the definition of the free energy functional as shown here in figure two, which has either minima or maxima at the bulk phases. Now for the kahn hilliard equation, the free energy functional is defined in a similar manner as described by Wheeler, Bottinger, or McFadden, or more popularly known as WBM model amongst the phase field community. Okay, so our first objective was to verify our models with the benchmark simulation from the NIST website. So for the Allen Kahn equation, we define a 1D computational domain with 400 grids along the length and the boundaries of the domain were assumed at no flux condition. So uh, this figure here shows the comparison of the numerical and the analytical solution from the NIST website, which shows good agreement. Now for the kahn hilliard equation, we again define a 1D computational domain of 20 micron length. So uh, the half of the domain was assumed at one phase and the remaining half was uh, assumed at another phase. So initially the whole domain was assumed to have initial composition of 0 0.5 with boundaries at no flux condition. So the figure here shows the evolution of the composition and the phase field, which again shows good agreement with the benchmark results from the NIST repository. Okay, yeah, uh, on ne next we try to simulate dendritic growth in a pure material. For that, the phase field equation is solved in parallel with the heat equation, where K is the latent heat in non-dimensional form. As I mentioned earlier, the epsilon is the gradient energy coefficient and to incorporate anisotropy in our model, we assumed epsilon to be a function of theta, which is angle to the normal to the interface and reference axis. Delta denotes the strength of the anisotropy and J is the mod of anisotropy, which takes four for a cubic material and six for a hexagonal material. Okay, uh, so figure here shows a 2D computational domain that we have used for our simulation. So initially the domain was filled with undercool melt and a solid nucleus was placed at the center of the domain. Again, we considered the boundaries at no flux condition. So the table here gives the value of thermophysical properties and the, com uh, the computational parameters used in our simulation. So first we tried to understand the effect of the anisotropy strength. So as you can see, without anisotropy from the phase field and temperature field uh, contours of these two fields, without anisotropy or at isotropic condition, the nucleus grows in the shape of a viscous finger. So as the anisotropy increases, the seed becomes unstable and it grows in the shape of a dendrite. Okay. Now we, we try to understand the effect of initial orientation on the dendrite from the equation here. So to do that, we perform simulation at different values of theta naught. So as you can see, without initial orientation, the primary arms of the dendrite grows in a direction parallel to the reference axis. And as the theta increases, the primary arms tends to grow in a direction which the theta makes with the reference axis. Now next, we try to understand the effect of the latent heat. So as you can see at very less uh, values of the latent heat, the nucleus grows at very fast rate. And as K increases, the growth rate becomes slower and it, it uh, grows in the shape of a dendrite with more side branches. Okay. Uh, moving on, our, uh, we try to simulate uh, the dendritic growth in a binary alloy. For that, I have again defined a computational domain, uh, which was discretized using uh, finite volume method 
on a grids of uniform squares. So initially the whole domain was assumed to be filled with super saturated liquid and a solid nucleus was placed at the center of the domain. Again, we assumed a zero flux condition at the boundaries. The figure here shows a typical uh, lens shape phase diagram for nickel copper alloy, which was obtained using thermocouple software. And the table here gives the properties of the nickel copper binary alloy that we have used in our simulation. So uh, solid trapping or empty trapping, uh, solid trapping is a phenomena that uh, I'm going to discuss in my upcoming uh, slides. So to reduce the solid trapping, we have also incorporated an anti trapping current term in our kahn hilliard equation. Okay, so uh, before I move further, I would like to show an animation of the dendritic growth for a binary alloy. Okay, and now to quickly discuss whatever we have seen in the video. I have given a picture of a full dendrite, which is a fourfold picture uh, with composition at the top and uh, at the bottom we have phase print. So as you can see uh, in the round circle, in, uh, the composition of the primary, uh, primary stock is lower compared to that in between the secondary and tertiary arms. The secondary arm, grows in a direction perpendicular to the primary arm and the root of the secondary arm is significantly narrower compared to that as it moves uh, further along the secondary arm. Also, we can see solute shaping and impeachment in between the secondary and tertiary arms. Okay. Uh, okay, so this uh, figure here shows the composition and phase field profile at uh, different time steps. So as you can see, initially the uh, nucleus grows in the shape of a star. And as the time progress, it becomes more unstable and grow in the shape of a full dendrite with secondary and tertiary arms. So this is a feature of a typical dendrite that can be obtained in a binary alloy with lens phase diagram, uh, as I have shown before. Uh, yeah, so this is uh, a lens phase diagram and this is the typical dendrite that you can see for a lens shape, uh, like uh, binary alloy. Okay, so yeah. So uh, the interface thickness is uh, one of the most important parameters in the phase field method. So uh, we, we try to understand the effect of the interface thickness in our uh, simulation. For that I have uh, performed simulation at different values of the interface thickness. So as you can see from the composition profile here, as the interface thickness increases, the likelihood of uh, collisions or solute trapping increases. Figure on the right here shows the composition profile. So as you can see, the composition profiles were obtained along the length of the primary stock. And on the, on the bottom table here, summarize the different features of the dendrite. So you can say that as the interface thickness increases, the tip radius increases and the tip velocity of the dendrite decreases. Hence for the subsequent simulation, uh, we'll be using an interface thickness, which is slightly more than the size of the grid. Okay, so as I've already mentioned, uh, during additive manufacturing process due to rapid solidification, uh, solid trapping is a severe phenomena and to reduce the solid trapping, we have introduced an anti-trapping current term in our uh, simulation. So here uh, I have shown the simulation of, uh, for the composition and phase field profile with and without uh, the anti-trapping current term. So as you can see, without the anti-trapping there, uh, we can see a lot of uh, solute trapping or tendency, tendency of solute trapping is more. And without, with anti-trapping, uh, we can see uh, less tendency of solute trapping. On the right here, I have shown uh, the composition and phase field profile at uh, with and without the anti-trapping current term. And at the bottom, I have shown the T velocity and partition coefficient with and without the anti-trapping. So the in interesting thing uh, here to note is that with the anti-trapping current term uh, on during the simulation, the solute partitioning is less, which is a good thing in terms of 
uh, additive manufacturing. Okay, uh, now to understand the effect of anisotropy parameter on the binary alarm model, we have performed a simulation at a different values of um, the delta, which is strength of the anisotropy. So as you can see, with at isotropic condition, it grows in the shape of a viscous finger. And as it, the anisotropy increases, the dendrite becomes more prominent. So figure on the left here shows the composition profile at different values of the anisotropy. And on the right, we have a tip velocity of the dendrite at different values of anisotropy. So as you can see that as the strength of the anisotropy or delta increases, the time required to reach the steady state is less. I have also plotted the solute trapping or, or solute partition coefficient at different values of the anisotropy strength, which increases with the anisotropy. On the uh, bottom right here, we have the steady state tip velocity, which shows linear increment with the anisotropy. I have again performed similar simulation uh, of, of for the anisotropy, but this time without the anti-tapping current. So this uh, growth morphology shows similar behavior uh, or similar dependence on the delta parameter. Okay, and on the right, on the left, I have shown the composition and T velocity, which again shows similar dependence on the anisotropy parameter. And on the right, I have the solute partition coefficient and T velocity with and without the anisotropy term, or sorry, anti-tapping term. So as you can see with, with the anti-tapping term, the solute partition coefficient is less. Okay, so uh, to finally conclude uh, the effect of the anti-tapping current term in our simulation, I have shown the full picture of uh, the dendrite with composition at the top and at the bottom we have phase field. So as you can see with, without the anti-tapping current term or when A is equal to zero, we have a lot of solute trapping and impeachment in between the secondary and tertiary arms. But with the anti-tapping current term, we are able to suppress the anti-tapping or solute trapping. So uh, uh, finally, we tried to compare our results with the work of Lan et al. And uh, the most important thing to note here is that uh, as the anti-tapping term is on during the simulation, the solute partitioning is very near to that equilibrium partition coefficient. Okay, uh, so before I can conclude the work, uh, the model that I have presented here is suitable to simulate dendritic growth in a binary alloy at isothermal condition. We have observed realistic dendritic growth pattern in our uh, simulation with secondary and tertiary arms. Also with the inclusion of the anti-tapping current term, we are actually able to suppress the non-equilibrium uh, partitioning. Additionally, with, uh, due to the rapid solid, during rapid solidification for uh, the AM process, solid trapping is a severe phenomena and further investigation on the anti-tapping current term is still required to be more confident with this model. Okay, and uh, in terms of the future aspects of our research, we're trying to include the heat equation in the model to not just limit ourselves in the isothermal condition. And also we are trying to switch into the adaptive grid method so that we can perform simulation at very less interface thickness, which is a very important phenomenon for parameter in phase field model. Also, we are trying to simulate columnar grains. So the, like whatever we have shown, I have shown here, the dendrites is for equivalent grains. So we are trying to simulate columnar grains in our, which is particularly interested for EM process. And uh, I'm trying to collaborate with one of my colleagues, which is working on cellular automata models or sharp interface model. So we'll try to validate our uh, growth kinetics of the phase field models with the cellular automata models. Okay, and before I finish, I'd like to uh, thank Damien Tudor uh, in uh, India Materials he, for his uh, support and discussion uh, during the course of our research. I would also like to uh, thank Science Foundation Ireland 
for the financial support uh, to carry the conduct the research and last but not the least uh, the you see the high performance computing i think it's it's not visible here it's sonic so i'd like to thank sonic uh, servers for uh, giving me the opportunity to perform simulations so yeah uh, this is the summary of my talk so these are the sol solver that have been like developed and still in development process so first we show, we show the validation of ln khan and khan hilliard equation which is the most important equation for uh, the phase field equation uh, for phase field methods then we performed dendritic simulation for a pure material a pure nickel so you can see uh, the video here and also we have performed dendritic growth in a binary uh, binary alloy with anti tapping current term and these models will be uh, further uh, investigated in uh, in terms of uh, the edit manufacturing uh, aspects so with this i uh, conclude my presentation thank you uh, so much for attending thank you so yeah i'd like to take some questions yeah, the mic, so yeah sure, sure. okay no, also <laughs> thank you so okay are there any questions Yes, just let me go over. Uh, thank you very much for your wonderful presentation. I might have missed it, but I didn't understand what open foam solver you have used. Have you modified it? Was it enough to use an existing solver? What has happened on the solver architecture? Thank you. Thank you so much for your question. So we started from the Laplacian foam or incompressible foam, and actually we modified everything, most of the thing from the equation. So that's why I didn't show any any of them. That's a good question anyway. Thank you. It's it's a real customized solver. Yeah. So okay. So so we we have I think a question in the chat. Is there a plan to extend this work to tannery system, three or more species? If yes, what approach will you use? So, uh, okay, I'll answer your question partly. So in terms of approaches, the approach will be the same, like the for uh, phase field method. But if you consider about turning models, we can, uh, we can incorporate uh, this, um, the, the, like uh, gives free energy from the thermocalc software uh, in our models to get the parameters for the ternary alloy, or we can still or we can still consider the ternary alloy uh, as a pseudo binary alloy, depending on the type of the problem that we have. I, th I think there are a lot of papers which have considered ternary alloy as a binary alloy. So yeah, that that should be our approach. Yeah. Okay. I look around also in the chat. Ah, there is one more by Mila. Did you use Alan Kahn or Kahn Hilliard for the dendritic growth simulation that you showed? Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, for uh, for the pure material solidification, uh, as you can see in the slide. So we have used uh, Alan Kahn equation for the pure material, and for uh, the binary alloy, since we have to deal with a conserved order parameter, which is the composition in our case. So we have to deal with the uh, modified diffusion equation are most popularly known as the Kahn Hilliard equation. Okay. In some cases, both. Yeah, in some cases, both, we have to use both. Mm -hmm. Okay. So once more, I look around. There's one more. I even one before that I have overseen. Uh -huh. Thank you. So let's scroll a bit up then. Uh -huh. Make sure that I didn't oversee one more. No. So how sensitive are the results to changes in the initial condition, particularly the type of meshing, TED or HEX? Yeah, so that's a very good question. Uh, so if you remember, I have shown one slide with the interface thickness. So which is again a function of the mesh, uh, size of the mesh. So it, uh, the phase field models are very sensitive to the type of meshing. And we, small, we use very small mesh size uh, in the phase field models. And I don't know, I think I'm able to answer his question. 
Okay. But you used hex meshes. Yeah. Yeah. So hex meshes have been used. Okay. okay. Yeah. I, yeah. I missed that. Perfectly fine. We have one more question in the present audience. So. Thank you. Uh, actually, it was about the same related question for that one. That's why I, I saw it. Uh, do you thought about using adapted mesh refinement over the surface when it's yeah, grown? So, yeah, it's really like uh, saying that on a few aspects of our research, that's what I have mentioned. So we are trying to, we are already working on that. So uh, we have tried the mesh refinement for a pure material and we are still working on uh, for the binary, uh, binary alloy. So that's why I have not mentioned that in your results. Yeah, thank you. Okay, now let me scroll down one more in the one more time in the chat. Okay, I think that that question has been already answered. Ah, yeah, one more in the present audience. Just give me a second. Thanks, Abdul. It was really, uh, really great talk. I was just wondering, you said that you'd like to look at this for like additive manufacturing. Um, I just wondered how you were going to deal with the fact that different grains have different orientations. So, um, yeah, what are your thoughts on how to deal with that in an additive manufacturing sense? Yeah, so uh, I have, if you, if you just uh, closely look at the slides, so this one is slightly rotated by some angles. So that means our uh, an isotropy parameter, we can, uh, we, can, with the, we can play with the orientation of the dendrite. So if, you, uh, if we consider the gradient energy to be a function of the interface normal or angle, or if, like in, in phase field terms, if we, if we consider that we are including an isotropy in our model, so we'll just, uh, I think that will help us to in, like uh, do simulation with uh, particularly with uh, different orientation like uh, most in uh, if you if you know the karma model so they have uh, done a lot of works on like uh, columnar grains with particular orientation so yeah so i'm i'm now working on that and i think the implementation of the orient uh, anisotropy is same orientation yeah sorry so different grains have different orientations so if you 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 see the, your phase field the you know you might rotate them all the same way but they'll they'll all be rotated the same way because you have one phase field order parameter as well okay uh i'm not sure but i think like in that case i have to go to multi-phase model so like yeah because yeah the model i have here is only two phase so i can only simulate only a particular um, grain or like equation in, in this case. So yeah, in that case, I think it would be suitable for multiple, like if I move to multi-phase alloys. Okay. Sorry, I, I think this, when you could still, um, you could see them differently. And then when they impinged, you could maybe just say there's no more, you know, don't let them merge or so. Yeah, it's really great, really, really interesting presentation. Maybe I'll just be in touch with you yeah, regarding yeah. that. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay, we have a very vivid discussion here. We have one more in the in the chat. In AM process, the free surface is a major issue. Is there a plan to develop this customized model in that direction? Okay, so yeah, that's a, that's a very good question again. So yeah, I will again refer to, refer to my slides. So yeah, we actually we are uh, working as a group in iForm or in UCD. So everyone is uh, we have a, a platform too, which which looks and on the different aspects or different uh, physics of the EM process. So there is one guy in our group who, who works on the surface modeling or the powder bit modeling. Uh, so I can uh, like give his contact number or like contact details if you want to have further discussion on that. I'd not like, like to comment on that because I have not much idea about it. Just let me know in the chat or like in the whoever app if, if you want to get in touch with him. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Let me one more time scroll up as well. But I think that was a question. Yeah, we have already answered. Any further questions in the audience? And not in the chat. So let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. Thank you.